Today we are talking about gastrointestinal bleeding or in short GI bleeds. We are going to go over what it is, causes, symptoms, questions you need to be asking, what the workup consists of, and then spending most of our time on the treatments and nursing tips. So if you want to be a better ER nurse when it comes to GI bleeds, stick around. So what is a GI bleed? Keeping it simple, it's bleeding from somewhere along the GI tract. Do remember that GI bleeding is not a disease. It is a symptom of a disease. So this bleeding in the GI tract gets divided into upper GI bleeding and lower GI bleeding. Know that bleeding from the upper GI is going to be more common and that upper GI bleeding can at times have a greater mortality than lower GI bleeding. Now let's go into some of the causes. We're going to first start off with the causes of an upper GI bleed. So the most common cause of an upper GI bleed is going to be peptic ulcer disease. Then you also have varices, which can either be esophageal or gastric varices. Remember that your liver patients who have increased portal hypertension are at an increased risk for varices related to the increased pressures and the backup of blood. Then there's esophagitis and gastritis, as well as Mallory Weiss tears, which are tears in the lining of the lower esophagus as a result of forceful coughing and vomiting. Going down the list, there's also malignancies, and as we know, they can be very vascular and they can bleed. Then there's also other conditions where arteries and veins become exposed within the GI tract, so they end up bleeding. There's also aortoenteric fistulas that can form after repairing abdominal aortic aneurysms. So that's one, that's another cause of upper GI bleeding. And then don't forget that chronic alcohol use is associated with liver issues, gastritis, and other GI issues. And also keep in mind that chronic NSAID use, chronic steroid use, and blood thinners as well can predispose and cause upper GI bleeding. Now, let's get into the causes of lower GI bleed. First, let's start off with saying that an upper GI bleed can be a source of a lower GI bleed as the blood from the upper bleed will end up being expelled, being confused for a lower GI bleed. Know that if a upper GI bleed is very rapid and large and brisk, the blood can actually make it all the way down and still look very bright red. And then although we know that most of the time when the bleeding is very small, by the time it reaches the bottom, it will look black as a result of digestion. So just be aware of that color, the blackness, right? Now, other causes include diverticulitis, infections like colitis, you have IBS, you have cancers again, malignancies and hemorrhoids as well, including others that can be the cause of a lower GI bleed. Now let's get into talking about the symptoms. So the classic symptoms of an upper GI bleed include bright red emesis or coffee ground emesis as well as black stools. Then as for lower GI bleeding, you have red bloody stools. But because it is the ER, we must spring into action when we note symptoms of an unstable patient, an unstable GI bleed. These symptoms include bright red emesis or bright red stools and the patient is pale, they're dizzy, they're weak, they're confused and getting altered, they're also tachycardic and hypotensive. So you have to pay attention for, for symptoms like this because it shows you that your patient is starting to get into shock and you have to act quickly. Now let's get into some of the questions you need to be asking your patients. These include when did the bleeding start and how much bleeding have they noticed? What is the color, whether it's bright red or is it dark? Are there any other accompanying symptoms like weakness, dizziness, and the others that we discuss? Have they ever had any prior GI bleeding and what was done? What was the cause? Any recent abdominal surgeries? What about any recent medical problems or overall just medical problems? Paying close attention to issues with the GI tract. What about current medications? Also paying close attention to blood thinners, NSAIDs, and steroids, as well as iron intake. Does the patient drink alcohol on a regular basis? Or is there a history of liver issues as well? So those are questions you should be asking your GI bleeding patients. Now let's talk about the workup. Starting at the top, 
a CBC and a BMP will be obtained. The CBC will give the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, and platelet, as well as a white count. Then the BMP will have the electrolytes and kidney function. Liver function should also be checked, especially since the liver plays a big role in coagulation. Coagulation studies include your PT, PTT, and INR. Also, bedside guaiac testing will, will be performed by the provider to verify for the presence of blood in the stool. And while doing the guaiac, the provider will also assess the area for hemorrhoids and so forth. Since lactate help us, helps us check perfusion status, trending lactates can be useful to ensure that treatments are having a positive effect. Know that a lot of the blood work that is obtained is to have a baseline for comparison. So just be aware of that. Also know that other labs like a troponin may be added because the heart can get stressed by the anemia caused by the, by the patient losing so much blood. So providers on top of getting an EKG to check the heart can also get a trope just to make sure that no cardiac ischemia is occurring. Providers can also perform bedside abdominal ultrasounds or order CTs to help determine where the bleeding is coming from. However, among the most helpful diagnostics is going to be an EGD, since it can be also used to simultaneously treat the patient, whether through a variceal banding or clipping or any of the other methods available to the GI docs who perform the EGD. Then if the EGD is not successful, but the CT showed where the bleeding is coming from, interventional radiology can actually or can go in the patient and perform embolization, which essentially just means cutting off blood supply to the bleeding area. Now let's talk about treatments. So we're going to spend a little more time talking about treatments and then the nursing tips. As always, with any patient, we are going to start off with the ABCs. If you, if you want to know more about the ABCs, I'm going to tag my video on it here. Otherwise, when it comes to GI bleeds, you have to decide if the patient is unstable or stable, meaning are they bleeding out so much that they are in shock with unstable vital signs or are vital signs stable? The patient is ANO times four, speaking in complete, in complete clear sentences, just looks a little pale because if the patient is very unstable, for example, the patient is vomiting large amounts of bright red blood, they're getting more tacky, they're getting more hypotensive, they're getting more pale and now they're altered. Well, that's going to warrant the, that rapid actions be taken, like placing a large bore IV, giving a fluid bolus, or even perhaps going straight to blood products, including perhaps initiating your organization's massive transfusion protocol, where large amounts of blood products are given to your patient through a rapid transfusion, transfuser, which is a machine that pumps the blood into your patient very rapidly. Now let's go down the list. Get large bore IV access as soon as you can because we're going to need it for medications, fluids, and even blood products. Of course, also get your patient on the monitor, especially to get a blood pressure and a full set of vital signs. A fluid bolus may be ordered to help maintain your patient's blood pressure and it gives the lab some time to come back, especially if the patient is still relatively stable. Then of course, if needed, blood products can be given and these include packed red blood cells, plasma, and platelets. Common medications that you may see ordered include a proton pump inhibitor like Protonix to help with mitigating acid production, which helps with decreasing rebleeding rates and promoting clot formation. You may also see octreotide when variceal, variceal bleeding is expected, as it should help with decreasing portal hypertension, therefore decreasing the bleeding. And you may also see a broad spectrum antibiotic like ceftriaxone ordered to help decrease possible infections like SBP, which stands for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. In regards to medications, also don't forget blood thinners because you may need to reverse these blood thinners. So be aware of the different antidotes that can be used for different blood thinners. Next, you have what's called a Blakemore tube or a Minnesota tube, both performing similar actions. So this is the Blakemore tube. They are used for varices. Essentially, a catheter is inserted down into the stomach, then pumped a certain amount of air, sort of like filling a balloon, so that the pressure exerted by the balloon on the varices tamponades them and prevents them from bleeding. This, of course, is inserted by the providers, but we monitor it, paying close attention to the pressures within the balloons by checking the meter to ensure it's not too high as it can lead to necrosis. 
then of course the geodocs will perform their treatments with the egd and then ir can go in and perform embolization as we talked about and the last resort can be surgery as well now let's go into nursing tips and information that you as a new er nurse should be aware of so first learn how to set up your hospital's rapid blood transfusion then get the iv in the into the easiest spot which is usually going to be the ac if a patient just started bleeding hence an acute gi bleed the hemoglobin may come back as normal as it has not had time to dilute so don't get fooled especially when you're seeing your patient vomiting large amounts of bright red blood in front of you try to keep your patients warm as the cold can affect clotting Keep in mind that you shouldn't over transfuse your patients, especially those with variceal bleeding, because the higher the pressure within the vascular, the more the patient is going to keep bleeding. So that's why providers at times can be okay with the patient still having a soft blood pressure. Also, if you over transfuse and increase the BP too much, it can disturb any clot formation that may be occurring at the side of the bleeding. Then the threshold for transfusing blood is a hemoglobin of seven and, and know that a that one unit of PRBCs is supposed to raise the hemoglobin by around one. The threshold for transfusing platelets is going to be 50,000. Your patient may get an order to have repeat H's and H, which is hemoglobin and hematocrit. So just make sure that you don't miss that order on accident. You may also be giving calcium after giving blood because there's a preservative that gets added onto the blood that binds the calcium. So you may have to give calcium on top of it because of all this other blood you're giving your patient. And then don't forget to review your reversal meds for blood thinners. And if a patient is going to get a Minnesota tube or a, or a Blakemore tube, they will have to get intubated beforehand. So be prepared for that. And finally, don't forget to monitor and assess your patients. So now let's get into the question of the day. What paralytics are typically used during rapid sequence intubation and why? As always, the answer will be at the bottom of the description text that is located under the video. Thank you for your time today. I hope that I was at least able to teach you one thing. If you want to keep learning, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's and the case files. As well, please take the time to watch my other videos. Also, if you would like to help support the channel, I have nursing stickers and shirts on Redbubble that you can check out again. Thank you for your time today. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.